coming at you live from America's podcast studio, Eric the Turf Teacher Jones. The landscape contractor and green industry platform for success. This is The Podscape, brought to you by LMA. And welcome everyone here to The Podscape. It is October 12th, Turf Talk Tuesday, and tonight, guys, we are going to discuss natural pest controls in the landscape. Before we get started today, I want to give a big shout out to LMN Software because none of this would be possible without them. I've personally been using their software in my own company, and so far it's been a complete game changer for my business. LMN is the most comprehensive landscape business management software in the industry. From budgeting, estimating, CRM, time tracking, and so much more, it's a simple do-it tool for your landscape business and provides a platform to scale your company to the next level. And the best part about LMN is they have a free version, which you can begin using today if you choose to. Just visit golmn.com forward slash free to learn more and start taking advantage of the software that's helped me grow my business into a successful, sustainable, and profitable company. That's golmn.com dot com forward slash free g o l m n dot com forward slash free eric the turf teacher jones oh, yeah. teaching you life lessons business strategies and leadership let's grow together all right so welcome everyone Thank you for joining us here. We're going to talk about natural pest control, some cool stuff to talk about. Well, at least I think so. Anyway, I kind of enjoy uh, this topic uh, very, very much because uh, how many of y'all are getting a lot of customers not wanting you to spray pesticides on their properties? Has anybody come across that this year? Yes. They, they, uh, what's, what's going on, man? They, they don't like it, do they? No. They're, they're scared to death of Roundup. And so there are some other things that we can implement, but it's going to cost them a lot more money. It's going to cost us a lot more time, but it's still cool about this stuff. It's, it, it's more easier to use these natural pest controls, meaning predators and stuff like that, in a controlled environment. Why is it so hard for us to use some of these in the environment, in our natural environment? We're dealing with the open they wide have, world. What was they that? Have predators too. Do what, Mike? Um, well, if you're using like predator, um, like wasps or something like, that, they have predators too, don't they? Yeah. Well, and then they can fly off, can't they? Like, yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. They're not, they're not in that controlled environment. They can escape and run off and uh, and and leave. So that's that's the bad thing. Works great in the greenhouses. Um, you know, even some nurseries, you know, they can, they can use a lot of this stuff a lot more so than us in the, in the landscape, because, you know, they're going to feed for a little bit and then they're going to move on. But still, nonetheless, this stuff is actually pretty cool. And customers like hearing about this. Uh, so what do you think, what do you think mother nature's number one pest control is? What does she put down here on earth? The good Lord give us that probably is more beneficial to us than, than harms us. But people are scared to death of them. Bats. Bats is one of them. Bats is one spiders. of them. Spiders. Spiders. Spiders, yeah. Spiders yeah. is Mother Nature's number one pest control. They will eat more stuff that affects our, our uh, ornamentals uh, than anything else. But, David, you were talking about bats. They are still a super cool Natural pest control. And what's their favorite food? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. That's right. Yes, baby. But people freak out, man. People freak out when they see a bat, when they have one in their attic or whatever. <laughs> they're calling the structural pest control guys to come and get rid of those guys. They spend thousands of dollars to do it. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And they're they're the bats don't want to do it with us. They they just wanna they just wanna come out that at dusk and feed on those mosquitoes. And so let them be. What's the number one pest control for ticks? Um, no, um, uh, possum, possums. 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 And what is another cool fact about the opossum? What else do we use it for? 
to clean up dead animals. Do what? <laughs> no, baby. Putting them in a stew. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. If, I don't know if y'all remember if y'all were around in Winston Salem area. There used to be a morning show uh, on 104 WTQR, and uh, it, it was a grandma voice. She started calling in, and then they made her a full time DJ in the morning, and she'd talk about making possum pie and possum <laughs> stew. And <laughs> she had them rolling. But what else? Can, what else can we use these possums for? You know, most people they look at them, they're like, ah, it's an ugly creature. I think it's one of the it's cutest little things ever. Yeah, she's carrying her little babies on her back and stuff. They do not want anything to do with us. They want to be left alone. But you know that the possum can withstand up to 80 rattlesnake bites or coral snake bites and not die. No. Uh, that's wild. That is wild. Very wild. So what else are we using these guys for? What, so if, if, if they can withstand these snake bites, what are we using them for? Killing snakes. Yep. What do you say, Charles? Killing snakes. Well, yeah, they would. They'll do that. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, we're using trash to harvest. uh, Antivenom. Antivenom. Exactly. Oh yeah. We're using it for that. These guys. These are these are one of the coolest animals out there, and people, you know, they they do not like them. They do not like them. So we're going to jump into this hot and heavy. All right. So we will identify what are natural pest controls. And there's, there's a lot of other things other than predators or other insects out there. There's, there's quite a bit. We'll identify what are pests. But first and foremost, when we're identifying what are pests, what do you think the number one reason we have a pesticide failure is? If we actually make an application, and it's a total failure, and we do not kill the target pest, what's the number one reason that we enough. fail to do so? Wrong it's pesticide. We, yeah, we didn't control the environment. We didn't control the other stuff. Prior to that, what did we pesticide. incorrectly do? Wrong pesticide. Before that, Charles, we, oh, did, we may have chosen the wrong pesticide, but what did we do prior to even that? We didn't identify the right pest. Exactly, Sean. We incorrectly identified the pest. We thought it that's the number one reason we have a pesticide failure is misidentification of the pest. We think it's something when it's actually something else. And so, Mr. and Ms. Smith, they're going to get mad. They're going to call you back. They're going to say, you got to spray it again. Spray it again. Now, pest. There's a lot of things out there that can be pests. There's a lot of things out there that can actually be a welcomed guest in one situation, but a pest in another situation. Can anybody give me an example of what might be a pest and a guest on the same street? Ladybug. Ladybug, yeah. Some people would hate it. Like, Like I get like here in the office, I'll get like 20 or 30 congregate in the corner. And I'm like, how in the world are they even getting in the house? And so, yes, even though we're pesticide applicators outside, I still have a, uh, a, a subscription to the structural guys. They come by and, and do all the stuff in here because it's an old farmhouse that we run the office out of, and we just want to make sure everything's in there. So they'll, they'll get it, or we'll get the old vacuum and kind of suck them up. But they are pretty, and they help us when we need to, but it does become like a little pest in the house. What about a plant? Can somebody tell me what is a plant that can be a welcomed guest or a pest ivy ivy yeah yeah it can get out of control that's it. <laughs> yeah. that's cool. it. no that was uh no that's invasive what about what about for the old turf grass professionals bermuda bermuda exactly <laughs> can't stand it if we look, but if, if you like playing golf or you like watching football, baseball, I mean, all of that stuff is played a lot on Bermuda, and we like seeing that. But guess what? If we're cutting tall fescue, we don't want to see that stuff encroach at all. So it can be a pest or a welcome guest. We'll identify how these natural pest controls work, and then we will identify ways that we can use these 
natural pest control. So people are interested in hearing about other ways of getting rid of these pests with actually not having to use a pesticide. And if we start looking at things like integrated pest management, people are going to want to hear that. They're like, wow, you can actually help me out here in my landscape without putting down pesticides. Well, Yes, but integrated pest management does not mean that we don't use pesticides at all. It just means that we use it as a last resort. Because guess what? We couldn't feed the world if it wasn't for pesticides. We couldn't. There's no way. There's no way. We would lose, you know, 30 to 40% of our crops if it wasn't for actively using pesticides. So no matter how much people may not like it, we still got to have it. All right. A couple more people were sitting right here in the, in the room, but they could hear us. All right. So welcome those that just joined in, Paul, Julian. Thank you, guys. Um, but these natural pest controls will actually help us sell some jobs. There are people out there that will pay for it because they will fire us if they see us show up with a backpack sprayer on our back. In this lesson, we look at the balance of nature and some of the fundamental ways in which living organisms control their own population and populations of other living organisms. Mother Nature had the most perfect system design, but guess what? We as humans, we like to mess that thing up. And so it's up to us to put it back in balance. All right. So obviously when we look at all organisms, we are including the subset of organisms that we regard as pests. And again, certain situations, a living thing could be the pest or it could be a welcomed guest. I know my kids, when they were growing up, they had these little mice that they kept in a fish tank, a little gerbil and stuff. But lo and behold, if they were to see something like that run across the kitchen floor, when they got up and got something to drink during the night, they would have freaked out, even though it looks just like what's in their, their tanks in their bedroom. So what is natural pest control? Does anybody want to take a stab at it? Mint. Hmm? Definition. What is natural pest control? Because we know what pest control is. We're actually controlling the pest. But what is natural? Introducing, a, a, like a ladybug, you were talking about earlier, to uh, do aphids on roses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and, and that's, that's yeah part of the integrated mm -hmm. pest management. We're not using a pesticide. But the true definition of natural pest control is pest control that occurs in nature without any prompting from humans. It just happens. Animals are going to kill animals. Yeah. Animals keep other animals in check. It happens every single day. But guess what? Like I said, us as humans, we mess it up. We disturb it. And that is not a good thing. We've disturbed this great system, and we must learn how to reestablish its effects. We go in, we cut down rainforest, and we want to pave the entire Earth's surface, it seems like at times, we're, we're destroying these habitats that a lot of these creatures actually live in. Think about it. Just think about us growing up. I, I'm still in what they call rural America in the country. But I remember growing up, we had to travel to go even deer hunting. My dad talks about not seeing any deer or any turkey here on the farm. And yeah, but to mid-90s. And then guess what happened? They, yeah, population they got, control in there. Yep, that's right. They got pushed out, and so they started They started here, and now we have an excessive deer problem, mm -hmm. you know? And, and to be able to go turkey hunting on the farm here, man, that is, that is, that is a, I mean, I think a luxury. But, you know, in high school and stuff, we had to travel a couple hours to even think about seeing a turkey. Yeah. So... We've messed it up, and now all this stuff is not in balance. Understanding the natural principles will help us tremendously in managing pest problems. Furthermore, these concepts 
are critical to the development of a successful integrated pest management program. And like I said, people are scared to death of Roundup. They see these news articles, you know, on television at night, and they're just like, we don't want it. We've had major properties that we take care of that's absolutely cut it out, no spraying. They don't want the turf grass sprayed. They don't want the shrub bed sprayed. And I'm like, you know, we've already signed a contract. We're going to have to change the price of this if you're wanting us to come in and pull weeds by hand. But that's not that's not beneficial for us. That's not profitable at all. So we're burning stuff back with weed eaters, and they're kind of letting it go. And it's almost embarrassing to take care of some of these properties because they don't want you using a spray. So what do y'all – what? Are, when y'all are running across this, what are y'all dealing with with these customers? So mine, I put, I, I've got some townhomes. There's well, there's summer grass though. There's Bermuda, Zoysia, uh, but we we hand pull everything in their beds around. But they pay for it. They pay uh, for it, don't they? Yeah, yep. they, they pay for it. And that's and that just adds to their monthly cost, big time, big time. So. That's that's good that you're handling it that way, and uh, and hopefully it's uh, uh, a, a good thing for you. But just think about it: if you had uh, you know acres and acres of properties that didn't want this done, and now that everybody's got good help, y'all is the help situation's gone now that the money stopped, right? That's right. That's probably <laughs> just. I mean, they lining up, ain't they? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. But they going. <laughs> they going to, ain't they? Uh, yeah. We actually ran some Facebook ads for, for help, and we had a tremendous amount of people send in resumes and apply for the job. Uh, we hired two off of it, but they were a mistake, so I don't know. We kind of got a little excited, maybe jumped the gun a little bit, mm-hmm. but uh, we'll see how it turns off. What about crabgrass? Digitaria species. It can produce <laughs> 2,000 seeds per square foot in a single season. And I love crabgrass. Why does why does this why does this guy love turf uh, love crabgrass? Money, well, money, money. <laughs> exactly. And I'm hoping the chemists don't come up with something that gets rid of it totally, <laughs> do we? We we oh, want no. this guy to come back every single year. It's two applications for us. That's and right. Yes, it's my pre-emergence. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my post-emergence. Yep. Yeah. So we, we we might sound a little greedy saying that, but crabgrass it is a money maker for us, and so uh, let's hope it keeps. We don't want anything to do with that, but knowing that it can produce two thousand seeds per square foot, guess what? It's going to get it's going to get all over the place. But us as lawn care professionals, as lawn maintenance professionals, how can we prevent this stuff from being moved? To the next yard what do we typically don't do when we finish cutting someone's grass blow your lawn mower off yeah blow that lawn mower off you know brush our pants off shake our feet off because we've even got it in our in our shoes we've got it on our pants we've got that mess everywhere and we don't want to spread it to the next yard or maybe we do right you can get the get the applications next year for those guys but just a nasty little picture of it. Now, think about this. With natural pest controls, the common house fly can lay 600 eggs, which mature in about six days in hot weather. And we've had some hot weather this summer. What do you think happens if there were no natural pest controls for the fly? I mean, mama's fly water can't do but so much. What would happen to the earth it would be covered in like an inch of dead flies in a month or something like that. I heard. Yes. And it's yeah. And, and probably about a month. Yes. But what if it went all summer? It'd be knee deep. It'd be more than that. It'd be thousands of feet deep in one summer. Uh, and think about that. I mean, two flies, two original pairs could cover the earth's surface in one summer, thousands of feet thick, deep, if there were no natural pest controls. You say one summer? One one summer. summer. One summer. Wow. But that's got to be perfect conditions, like hot and, you know, dry, 
No mm-hmm. birds, no spiders, nothing to wipe these guys out. If they were just allowed to do what they want to do, it could happen. Because you can even do it on the calculator. Let's say, you know, two equals the 600. So 600, they have 600. Then they have 600. They have six. I mean, you can do that like three times on your calculator, and it's you like way it. off the chart. <laughs> it's infinite. <laughs> it's infinite. Uh, too bad we can't harvest those guys and sell them for something, right? Uh, for sure. But given that, given that reproductive rate, thousands of feet thick around the entire planet in just one summer. But why has that not happened? Why has it not happened? Natural predators. Natural controls. Natural pest controls. Natural pest control. So what are some of natural pest controls? And and, and think outside the box. They don't necessarily have to be a living organism. What are some stuff that would get rid of these these flies? Temperature. What do you say? Temperatures one, drought. which would be weather. Yeah, drought. Yeah. Jumping spiders. Do what? Jumping spiders. Spiders, yeah. Anything else? Birds. They use sulfur. Uh, what, Sean? I use sulfur for sulfur? different things. Mm. Yeah, I what use a- sulfur for fungicide, um, and I use sulfur for insecticides. <laughs> Try to target the eggs. Yeah. Um, yeah. What else would help reduce these flies other than like the sulfur, the spiders, the weather? Chemicals? <laughs> yeah, well, not a natural control, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but food and habitat. What if we cut their food source off? What if they didn't have a place to stay at night? These are the things that we're kind of looking for when it comes to natural pest controls. So the most important ones are climate and weather. And you, can you guys see the slides at all? I didn't mm-hmm. even share my slides. Did a Lord? I haven't seen any yet. Mm-hmm. Guys, I do apologize. Share the screen. I'm just sitting here talking away. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. There we go. See him now. Yep. There yep. we go. But our our most famous ones. The ones that help us out the most are climate and weather, food and habitat, pathogens, predators, parasites, and peritosoids. So, yeah, we had a hot summer. Those flies are thriving. But remember the bee movie that had Tom Hanks in it and stuff with the bees flying around? What's the one thing that they hated? What did they get? Huh? Smoke. Smoke. Yeah, they didn't like smoke. And what's another thing they didn't like? I see a big old thundercloud off in the distance. All these flying insects and stuff don't like what? Rain. The rain. They got to go hide. They got to go hide. So they got to go back to their habitat. They didn't have nowhere to go. This this rain would knock them out of the air. If they have food, they couldn't, they couldn't survive. They're getting pathogens. It's actually like Mother Nature controlling it. She creates some of these diseases that get into these insects and other uh, things that we don't want. They kind of handle themselves. And then the predators, they get eaten. They get taken out. And I don't know. It's kind of weird, you know, but we've got – we can. I can sit here every morning and I can see a big old red hawk sitting across the road, and he's scaling across the strawberry fields. And then all of a sudden you'll see him swoop down. He's getting – he's getting field mice. He's getting rabbits. He's getting all kinds of stuff. It's fun and not fun, but it, it's amazing to see how all of this stuff works. And then we got the parasites and then the predisoids. What is the difference between those two? What's the difference between a parasite and a predisoid? Who parasites kills? Kill the host. Which one? Parasites. It's actually the opposite. Yeah. The par- oh, I thought a par- the, the paras, whatever, toids or whatever, they live off the, the larvae. Uh, uh, vice versa. No, like a peritosoid would be like a parasitic wasp that would actually inject their eggs into an aphid. And what are they and doing? And they would feed off of them while they're... While they're when, once they hatch inside of them, 
they'll feed off of it and kill it. And you'll be able to see that on an aphid. If you see like a little black pinhole, that means it's been infected or, or injected with the uh, the parasitic wasp. And the, the cool thing about these wasps, we really don't know what they are. There are people that manufacture them, but their botanical names are so long and they're, they're, they're so tiny we can't see them with the naked eye. And people are producing them and selling them to greenhouses to help get rid of aphids and stuff. It's amazing what we can do with biological controls. So the parasites don't generally kill the host? No, they just, they'll debilitate it. They'll, they'll just hang around and make it sick and stuff. Kind of like a, you know, like pinworms and stuff on kids. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. They'll, they'll make you, they'll make them sick and, and knock them back, but the pritosoid will kill it. So let's examine all of these in more detail. So climate and weather, the difference between the two. Climate is the long-term overview of temperature and humidity changes in a region. Weather is going to be your local and short-term variation of the climate. Now, there's a T-shirt in Boone, North Carolina, if any of you have ever been up there, it says, Boone, where else in the world can you see all four seasons in one day? And I truly believe that. You can see that here in North Carolina in the mountains. Hot, turns off cold, rains, and then can snow at night or whatever. It's going to change. But animals are affected by the climate. They're affected by the weather. For example, tomato hornworm. What do you think happens with these guys? Anybody grow any tomatoes over the summer? This summer, last summer. Mm -hmm. What happens with these guys? They kill your tomatoes and eat them. They but do. Why? Because of moisture or because not? Too much rain? It has, a, it has a lot to do with moisture. What is it that these guys don't like in the winter? Cold. It's cold? It Bent cold in the ground, yep, in the soil. But they don't, they don't like the soil to be what? Wet. Wet. Thought it was wet. Yeah, it's yes. not as wet. Yeah. If we have a wet winter, we're going to see less of these guys in the summer. If we have a dry winter, these guys are going to thrive underground, and when they come mm -hmm. out, they're ready to feed. The weird thing about these, you can go into a pet store. And they'll sell these guys for like five bucks a piece. Why? Lizards eat them. Lizards eat them. It's like their favorite food. Mm -hmm. So they're selling them like at a three pack for like $15. So you might make more money off these tomato hornworms than you would the tomatoes, wouldn't you? Maybe. Let's go get some tomato worms. Especially if we've got a if we've got that dry winter, like yes, the hornworms are going to be here. Uh, crazy. I walked into the pet store and I saw that. I'm like, "What do you have these guys here?" They're like, "Man, we sell them like crazy for people that's got these mm -hmm. lizards." I'm like, Yee. Uh. Eric the Turf Teacher Jones. Teaching you life lessons, business strategies, and leadership. Let's grow together. If you're needing irrigation, landscape, or pesticide credits, check out my website at turfteacher.com. Every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., we host Turf Talk Tuesday for pesticide credits and have online courses for both irrigation and landscape contractors. There are also several opportunities to get your credits at one of our seminars that we do throughout the southeastern United States and information on our Christmas lighting course. Check it out again at turfteacher.com. Food and habitat. If there's no food, there's no organisms. They got to have something to eat. The simplest non-toxic method of control can be limiting the pest access to food. Now, have you ever seen where people, you know, they have, they have issues with, with cockroaches? And, and guys, let me tell you something. It don't matter your income level. It can be a multi-million dollar house or it can be a run-down apartment. Everybody's got cockroaches. Mm -hmm. And the only problem is 
is when you see one run across the floor. What does that mean? <laughs> that means they looking. They they looking because there's too many. Of them. They, they got too many light. Yes, they don't like the light. They don't like running across that tile floor. They don't want to be around us. And if we see one crawling across the floor, that means their buddies have kicked them out of the the hiding place. <laughs> He's having to go find something else. So that's when it's time to call your pest control. But a lot of people will set their food, you know, their dog food bowls inside of another bowl with water around it. Why do they do that? So bugs will drown and they can't eat the food. Exactly. They've cut them off from it. And eventually these bugs are pretty smart. You know, they're, I, I'd say they're smarter than us because guess what? They're going to be here long after humans are taken off this planet. They'll take over the insect world. So cutting off that food source is probably the least non-toxic method. Now, habitat's just important as food. We have an example of the ash aphid on the Modesto ash trees. This was a situation where people um, would like to go in and cut these trees, kind of like what people do around here, crepe murder. They like cutting them back. So what happens when you cut these trees back? What happens in the spring? They get new foliage on them, and that's what they feed on. Exactly. The aphids are in the new foliage. So even if we're not cutting back the trees, or if we've got other plants, trees, even a crepe myrtle that you've not cut back, you're going to get some water sprouts at the bottom and stuff like that. You've got to cut these out. That eliminates a food source for the aphids. They want that fresh nitrogen. Yeah, you don't ever see them anywhere except for in the freshly cut areas of new growth on them, or in, in the area I'm in, RDU area. Yep, that's true, man. They, they want that fresh. They want that fresh. And so when is nitrogen the highest in plant material? Spring. Spring unfolds when the leaves unfold, and then again in the fall when we have leaf drop. And so the one thing that we're doing both times of year is putting more nitrogen in the soil, right? So we're actually creating more nitrogen for these aphids because that's what they're after. That is a food source for them. So don't cut back the trees and try to limit some of your nitrogen application. But that's hard to do. That is hard to do. They're going to get in these trees. They're going to curl up just like that, make those leaves look a little nasty. But they have two population peaks each season, the aphids. It corresponds when nitrogen levels are the highest in the foliage. Spring leaf unfold and fall leaf drop. And the one thing that we're doing these times of year is putting more nitrogen in the ground. But we need it. We need it. Here's a quote out of Plagues and Peoples from William McNeil. One can properly think of most human lives as caught in a precarious equilibrium between the microparasitism of disease organisms and the macroparasitism of large body predators chief among which have been other human beings. We're our own worst enemies. We really are. Just like these insects, they're taking care of each other. It's almost survival of the fittest. So with pathogens, it's going to occur when there is an overpopulation. When there's overpopulation, we're going to have resource depletion, which leads to malnutrition, which leads to competition for habitat. It's always led to disease and war within humans, just like the animals. They're going to kick each other out. That cockroach running across the floor is looking for somewhere else to be. Not a good thing. Plants and animals have been doing it long before humans were around, and guess what? They're going to be doing it forever, long after we're gone. Predators critical in the suppression of natural populations of animals and plants and together with pathogens and peritosoids that make up the wonderful world of biological control. They're going to be mammals, arthropods, microorganisms, or even fungus. They are the free living general feeders. Now, people still don't like them. People don't like snakes, do they? But should we really kill a black snake? 
No. Just turn and walk the other way, and when you turn back around, he's probably done gone. They don't want to be around you. And to actually see one, and I've seen this, I've walked up on it, a black snake eating a copperhead. They get rid of the bad ones. And people don't like mice in the house. Well, guess what? If you've got a black snake around the house, you're not going to have any of those critters around either. Squirrels. People don't like that. What's the best natural pest control for a squirrel? Telegun. A shotgun, <laughs> hell <of a> gun. <laughs> Close, a gun, hell yeah. A dog, a, a Labrador Retriever, man. Yeah. <laughs> a bull. I, I've yet to see a squirrel ever since we've had black labs around the house. And we've, I, I got my first lab when I was 25, and we've had one ever since. And, and usually two or three at one time, and the squirrels are gone. They don't want this place. But arthropods. Any of that stuff. People are scared to death of the predators that actually help us. These predators, they may eat a single prey at a meal, or they may consume many individuals as the convergent lady beetle. They're going to eat a bunch of stuff. Now, predatory insects in the larval stage must consume several prey to attain maturity. So predator adults lay their eggs near populations of prey, where the hatching young have a chance of obtaining food. Spiders are exception to the rule. What do they do? They lay their eggs in the web so the food comes to them. Yeah. Smart I've dudes, got, aren't got, they? I've got a writing spider that laid her eggs at my rental property's back door, and I knew she was about to make her baby spider cocoon, whatever you call it, and yeah. sure enough, in a few days, she did. And, and it hadn't hatched yet, but I have not disturbed it. And I've left my light on to attract bugs, bugs. to her well. Yeah. Yeah. And ain't, ain't, that, ain't that the coolest thing to watch? If you, you know, if you had the time to sit there and watch these bugs fly into it and she just spins well, them I'm, up. I'm, to, I'm trying to sell this house, so I'll go by periodically and turn the lights on and off during the day. And yeah. I have... I'm in the process of watching it, and she hadn't the the cocoon hasn't hatched yet. But when yeah. it does, it will be there'll be little spiders everywhere. Yep. And what happens if you shine a spotlight or a flashlight on all these little spiders? What what happens to them eyes? They glow. They, they glow, glow, man. That's a that's a that's a eerie feeling, man. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, and if you've ever killed a spider, like you see, you know, because most people do it. And you, you step on her or whatever, and she's got the eggs in her. I've, we've, I've actually killed a spider, and all the spiders run all over the place. Where they, I mean, it's just just a bad thing, bad thing. But then you shine that light, and all these little eyes looking up at you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, parasites, peritosoids, the difference. We talked about that earlier. Peritosoids kill the host. So which is more effective? Gonna be your peritosoid. Why? Why would that because, be for natural? I got you. Because it kills them. It'll kill them. The parasitic wasp. Example would be the pinworm of a parasite. They cannot regulate the pest, but they can debilitate it. They can knock it for a loop. They can set it back. Are um, those terms? Are those terms peritosoids? Are they uh, true with plants? Like you have. Um, Oh, uh, what's the plant everybody hangs up to kiss underneath at Christmas time? Mistletoe. Yeah. Mistletoe. I was trying to think of it yeah. earlier. Uh, is mistletoe it, considered a parasitoid to no. the host tree? It would probably be a parasite because it's not going to kill the tree. It's just okay. going to be there. Kind of like, I guess, Spanish it. moss, maybe even. Mm -hmm. uh, would English some of the ivy stereo. be a parasitic? Uh, I don't know. Well, uh, what about our, English ivy? Our question was English ivy. Is that I'm thinking like that true definition is if it, it you know, uses that host for food and oh. it's living. The oh, ivy yeah. is still probably attached at the ground and getting a lot of its nutrients and stuff. Probably yeah, from, it's not the ground. from the tree. Yeah. Sense. So, but still good points though there. I mean, there's all kinds of plants that, 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 uh, uh, will do that. Yeah. But these predators, they're the unsung heroes. 
of naturally occurring insect control. They're too small to notice, no common names, and then scientific names are too long and difficult to pronounce, just like some of our plants out there. Uh, but they're members of the insect order, just like bees and wasps, and they're host-specific. They're restricted in the number of species that they attack. Now, here is a picture of a parasitic wasp injecting those eggs into the aphid. And these poor little aphids, man, they don't know what to do. But what is the coolest thing about an aphid in their life cycle? What does the mama not need to reproduce? A man. A man. She is mm-hmm. she is totally independent, and she's going to make sure that the next generation is here. So, and I don't know. That's just an amazing diagram for me. And there's that little that little pinhole black hole that means that it's been it's been injected just like that. And those eggs hatch inside of it. That aphid is providing not only food but a habitat. It is a living space and it is it's eaten from within with within the inside. What of a horrible way to go. But that is mother nature. I'm just glad I was born a human being, right? I know we're mean to each other, but God almighty, could you imagine like just the struggle to stay alive every single day? Natural yeah. select? Yes. <laughs> Oh, man, it's crazy. So how do natural controls work? They work all the time. Then why do some pest populations grow so large that they become a problem? Well, we interfere with it. Two examples, two examples, houseplants being set outside and the California oak moths. Back to these houseplants. We're getting ready to bring them inside. You know, a lot of people have them sitting outside. It's getting cooler at night and stuff, so people are bringing them inside. What happens to these plants inside the house? What do yeah, what are they? Yeah, they get acclimatized. Yeah, they got to reacclimate to the inside. temperature. Yep. And what are they? What are they being exposed to inside that we probably don't even see? Bacteria. Other, Insects, disease, not enough light, they just deteriorate. But all of a sudden, when springtime gets here and we set these guys back out on the back porch, what happens overnight? They burn. Mm -hmm. They can burn. Exotic plants here. But what else? Exotic plants. So we have to kind of out, look outside it is. We got the, yeah. But what what what's able to get to these plants once they're outside? Pests. Huh? Mealybugs, scale, pests. And the natural predators that can get rid of some of them. They can get rid of some of the stuff that they get inside. But it's still, like you said, they've got to be acclimated to both situations. But these tropicals, they like it when it's hot outside and they like being out there in their happy place. California oak moth. This happened. Um, there was a moth that were defoliating all of the oak trees. And what do you think the first thing people wanted to do when they heard about this? Now, these are Californians. So they're, they're not that big on pesticides to begin with. But they what did they want? Them. Relocate them. <laughs> Probably they wanted to kill these moths because they were getting upset. They're getting upset that they're losing that their their oak trees are losing their leaves. So it took a couple of ag agents to wow. really study this. The moths were very very beneficial to the oaks. How would this? How would defoliating these oak trees be beneficial to them? It'll make Create them grow growth. back stronger. New growth, maybe. Take it does. <laughs> what Do what time frame were they eating the foliage? I mean, was it- in the in the in the summertime when there was no rain, so defoliation of the trees helped help with the water. Energy. Yeah, help with the water. Yeah, for yeah. Yep, there was no water lost through transpiration. It stayed. The water stayed. Now, these moths. What do they do when they're sitting there munching on these leaves? 
fertilizing. They're fertilizing. They're dropping. They're dro- They're. I mean, they were eating and pooping. And when the rains returned, guess what happened to the oak trees? They flourished. They flourished absolutely beautifully. This was Mother Nature coming in and doing her thing. Again, we were ready to kill the moths. We were ready to get rid of them, to either cut down the trees totally or use a pesticide and get rid of them. Not cool. Not cool. All we had to do was sit back and study it and figure out that this was just a natural phenomenon that was best for the trees. We need to learn more about these natural fluctuations that are part of a natural cycle of events in their ecosystems. We have to adjust our aesthetic opinions and reactions accordingly. And it's all based on aesthetics with us. You know, the spider, we're, we look at it and we're just like creeped out about it. Leave it alone. Even the damage on a vegetable plant. People don't want to eat any lettuce or anything that has holes in it. Well, what does that tell me if I go out to the garden and I get a head of cabbage or lettuce and it's got holes in it from insects or whatever, what does that tell me that's never been applied to that garden? Pesticides. Pesticides. It's healthy, yep. That beautiful head of cabbage that just looks perfect, guess what's been sprayed on? Pesticides. Yes, but aesthetically, people don't want to see the holes, but then they don't want the pesticides on it. You got to adjust that. People have got to realize that, hey, a few bug holes ain't going to hurt you. Hey, Eric, let me ask you a question right quick on that. You go to your local mom and pop uh, stand around here, you see that. Yeah. Organic in the uh, grocery store, you do not. How come? Yeah. That you see organic in the grocery store, but not at the... the, Right, and it looks perfect versus, you know, you go to your local mom and pop, you know, in North Carolina, anywhere, uh, and get it. I think the mom and pop, it's just like with our strawberries. People always ask us, you know, are they organic? And we're like, no. I'm like, y'all are complaining about the price of a gallon of strawberries being $12, $13. I said, we'd have to sell them for $20 a gallon if we got them certified by the government to say that they're organic. Just all the taxes, all the inspections and everything that you'd have to go through, people don't want to pay that extra price. Just like the farmer at the farmer's, you know, stand, he's environmentally growing them, you know, in a way that they should be. And they probably are organic. He just doesn't want to spend the money to get that organic stamp. So it's, 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 you know, when the government gets involved, guess what they do? They ruin it. Right. And so, and, and, and the, and the poor farmer that's doing the right thing. I mean, we've been more environmentally, sound as an industry for decades you know the true pesticide license holder that learns from you know nc state and north carolina at that puts together these pesticide manuals and stuff and we follow that and we correctly calibrate our equipment and measure out the correct amount we're doing more good for the environment than we'll ever harm it it's the unlicensed guy out here that's just dumping you know more pesticide than needed and not knowing how to calibrate the machines, they're the ones giving us a bad rap because trust me, I think it was the university of Georgia. I remember reading this in school that the quarter acre lot of turf grass, meaning that it's a good stand of turf grass, no weeds cut at the correct height, getting the correct amount of water through supplemental irrigation, a quarter acre lot will reduce more carbon emissions than the family of four that live in that house can create. And so people need to realize that turf grass and and everything that we do in the green industry helps the environment. And, And look at golf courses. People think golf courses are the most environmentally unfriendly environment. No, look at the wildlife. Look at, the the carbon emissions that it pulls out of the environment. I mean, they are a good natural place uh, for a lot of things. And so we, we just get a bad rap in this industry. And the reason 
that Harris Teeter and Lowe's and all them can sell that organic food is because these are corporate farms that can pay the money to get them certified. So the local farmer growing and selling at the fruit stand and us at our strawberry stand, we just, we can't afford it. And it's, it's not worth the hassle to get all that approved. Good question, man. It's, uh, um, I don't, I don't like that word organic, you know, because yeah, every, yeah. Every, everything we do is for the right reasons and we do it the correct way. And just because it's got that stamp on it, people automatically think, you know, Hey, it's better. You know, there's nothing like, you know, free range chickens, you know, but then they sell that organic chicken and I'm sorry, it, it goes, you know, through a process that's nothing organic when you ship it across the country. Right. So, you know, local, local is as organic as you can get in somebody's backyard that's selling it out of a fruit stand. So. Organic's just a dollar figure. Yep. It's a dollar yeah. figure. Isn't it? Yep. Yep. So, but most of our serious pest problems are introduced to us. They were exotic. One being that indoor cockroach, gypsy moth, jap beetle, Mediterranean fruit fly, Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, dandelions, kudzu, water hyacinth. All of this was introduced to us. And we breed plants to satisfy human desires. We sometimes destroy the, the traits that discourage insects. The hybrid rose, for one. You know, grandma's roses just didn't look as bad as the ones we buy in the nurseries today. Hers could withstand everything. Oh. And we must thoroughly investigate how we can maintain the natural controls when altering plants or combining plant materials from different environments. And guys, it goes back to the designer. There are landscape architects and landscape designers out there that are putting plants together, some that like wet feet and others that can't stand any water, that need to be in a xeriscape garden. We have to know our plants. We have to know our insects. We have to know our pests. And it all boils down to correctly identifying the plant, the pest, and the situation that it's in. Mm -hmm. So, cool deal, guys. That was a very fast hour. So, we are, we are at the end. I'm trying to stop the share. All right, so there we are. Any questions, comments, or concerns? I know there's a couple more people I need to get a uh, pesticide license number from. Uh, Tooney, I saw you jump in. Are you still here? And, Paul, what's your license number, sir? Uh, 026. Yep. Dash one two one one zero. Oh. All right, good deal. Class Class L. Ornamental. Okay, yeah. Ornamental turf. Cool. Yep. Yeah, all Tunis. I do is spray. That's all you do is spray. Cool. That's all I do. Southern turf. Where, where, where are you at? Coast. You're in Charlotte. Ken or? I'm in Kenston. Kenston. Okay. Okay. Yeah, cool. I, I service Goldsboro to the coast. Okay. Cool. Yep. Mainly, mainly uh, like turf grass or doing ornamentals and no, trees? That's all, all, all I do is uh, turf grass, and I do insecticide and fungus, uh, fun, uh, fertilize bushes in the spring and the fall. Okay. Yep. Yep. Cool. Good deal, man. Good deal. Any other questions, comments, concerns? And I'm writing down who I saw drinking beer during the course. Uh, <laughs> 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 I hit mine. <laughs> uh, hey, you can't. You 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 you, I've got a question for you if you've got everybody's information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you think about um, uh, Atrimex? Atrimex as a growth retardant? Yes. I love it, man. I love it. We, uh, we put it on hollies. We put it on uh -huh. Ely Agnes hedges. Uh, it'll stop Ely Agnes, man. You'll only have to cut it one time a year. Uh, okay. But I am, I am all for that. Uh, it's actually, I think good for the plant. It creates more of a dense, you know, compaction. 
but you can go in and cut it and man, it's, you're not going to have to prune. And if you've got a contract where you're pruning twice, right. You, you cut it and then wait for that, that little bit of new growth come out and hit it. It stops, man. There is no more pruning until next can, spring. Can so you I did a bunch of it this year, but I had some issues on privets, uh, ligustrum. Oh, and- it'll, it'll kill privet and ligustrum. And we made that mistake and lost a huge contract. I, my, my fault too. I mean, I should have read the label, but it'll, it'll, man, it'll kill privet dead. And hell, you can't yep. get Roundup to kill privet. But man, you exactly. That's what I was, <laughs> yep. That's why I was curious on it. But yeah, I had really good. I mean, it was, I think it's a good product overall. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to cut in on you, Paul. Oh, no, it's cool. You cannot put it on Ligustrum, though, huh? No. Mm-mm. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, after you read it. I mean, there's – there's. well, it depends. I, it, well, going off the label, it tells you privet. It doesn't say anything about Ligustrum. Yep. Okay. But I had the same issue off Ligustrum. Yeah. I mean okay. – uh, it browned it out, didn't kill them like it did privets, but it, uh, I mean, it hurt them. It and wiped it, out the privet. What kind of uh, growth retardant, if any, can you put on Ligustrum? I don't they know of any. Granular, they have a granular. That's they do have a granular. Good, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, not sure shot. Uh, something similar to it that seems to be, or that I've used that's pretty good. You put around the base. Um, yeah. You know, with a, like a little chest spreader or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. I did the Atrimex on it, and, and like that, man, it was it was a mistake. It, it really was. Well, yeah. well, what did you say it was similar to? Uh, sure, I think it's sure shot. Sure shot. Oh, okay. okay. But uh, it's uh, it's a it, well, like I said, I'm 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 sure Eric, you've used it, uh, like you said. But you know, this was the first year I tried it uh, across the board on some commercial properties, uh, just because of COVID and the help situation. Yeah, uh, yeah. back on your man hours for trimming, you know, trimming shrubs, everything I yeah. got times a year or more. Yeah. Um, well, and it was really good, but it's it's uh, it's expensive. But like I said, it, it's. You got to have that application that you got to put that app or apply that application within that, you know, 48 to 72 hour time frame of your new growth or trim. Yep. Um, or you can really tell a big difference on it. Yep. The reason I was asking is, is my girlfriend, she's got miles of ligustrum as a hedgerow. I mean, it's everywhere. And she's just about to get the, the landscaper over here to do her spring cleanup in the fall. And so we're going to be trimming all this back and knocking off a couple feet of, off a height. And if I could find a retardant to put on it, whoo, that would save in the future. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, I mean, good luck on that one. That's why I was asking, uh, you, you know, those two have been, have been tough uh, to deal with. But but overall, yeah. like I said, the Atrimex, you know, if you don't mind spending the money up front. Yeah. Uh, it's a good it, price. It pays off in the long run. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I think yeah. I I applied it at uh, one and a half ounces per gallon. It calls up to three on Hollies, and depending on what what uh, type of shrub that you're putting it on, uh, yeah. and I still have pretty good uh, pretty good luck with it. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Matt. Good stuff, man. See, always learning something new all the time. That is cool. So, hey, Eric, I, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right, guys, y'all have yeah, a good one, man. Hey, Eric. Right. Yes, sir. Okay, hey, Eric, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, I have a all. question. Um, hey, man. So, yes, sir. Hey, every time you post up, uh, like tonight, to get a credit, this DLN and X, yeah. like every time that I've done it, I got a credit, right, no matter which one it was, or is it the L every time? No, you, like wh- which categories do you have? Probably L for ornamentals and turf, right? Yep, ornamentals yeah. and turf. Yeah, which is and category D. L. Category N or category D is for dealer. Uh, category N is for research, and then category X is for the farmer, uh, the private, oh, the private we're good individual. Then. Yeah. So yeah, if it, all right, we're good then. If, if you're ornamentals and turf, you want to see the L. And in all of my classes get L, you know approved for L. All right, cool. Yeah. That was yeah. my question. If all your classes were L, 
Yeah, all yeah, right, all good. of them. Yeah, and then they'll 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 certify some of them for uh, right away yeah, and right aquatics. Away. I have so. those too. Right away, but... I got one hey. quick question. Okay. Yes, one, sir. One quick question. A good yeah, Mike. Nat- what's a good natural control for spider mites? For spider mites, hmm. Bifen. Yeah, bifen if well, depending on what you're putting it on, where. Or neem oil, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Natural control, because this is a plant that's edible. It's a, a, a south neem south. oil. If it's edible, yeah. use neem oil yeah. and make sure you wash it off afterwards. But you need. Yeah. To- yep. They're right. Yep. That's it. Cool deal. Thank you. All right, guys. Awesome. Thank you guys for being here, man. I appreciate yep. it. Good. Thank you. He's posted yes, tonight. Thank you. See you. See you. Bye bye. Thank yeah. you. For more landscape business expert advice, check out golmn.com forward slash blog. And once again, a massive shout out to LMN Software for sponsoring this podcast and making it all happen. LMN is the most comprehensive landscape business management software in the industry. From budgeting, estimating, customer relationship management, time tracking, and so much more, it's the true do-it-all tool for your landscape business and provides a platform to scale your company to the next level. And the best part about LMN is that they have a free version, which you can use today if you choose to. Just visit golmn.com forward slash free to learn more and start taking advantage of the software that's helped me grow my business into a successful, sustainable, and profitable company. That's golmn.com forward slash free. And thanks again, everyone. And I'll see you in the next lecture. And that wraps up this episode of the Podscape. Thank you so much for joining us here, guys. I love each and every one of you. Life lessons and landscape lectures brought to you by the Turf Teacher and LMN Software. We'll see you in the next episode. Turf Teacher out.